Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode here on Sticks and Bones with your ghost host, Chelsea and 10. Hi, 10. How are you? I am good. How are you, Chelsea? I am good. I'm so excited to be back with another episode. It's our third episode of the season. So I'm super excited. Oh my gosh. Oh, first of all, so excited that we're on to the big three. Um, I feel like it's always like our third episode, like that just like we just come out of the gates, underworld gates swinging. And yeah, we do. We definitely do. Um, it's so interesting because the topic that we're talking about today, you know, is something near and dear to both of our hearts. But um, talking about, you know, things changing or looking into sources, that kind of stuff. Um, I was just downstairs with my husband and he was saying how, oh my gosh, you know, Disney's Animal Kingdom is closing next year. And I was like, what? okay, as, as Disney girls, Chelsea and I need to discuss. So he's on the phone with his father and he's like, his dad asked him straight up, like, where did you get your source from? And Kevin's like, oh, it came up on Apple News and here's where it is. And he had to actually backtrack it. And it found that he was actually like the Internet has been picking up this story via TikTok. And it originally came from a satire Disney account, like news office. So something has been going on on the internet where <laughs> I guess it happens quite a lot for Animal Kingdom. I don't know why they're picking on that one, but that Animal Kingdom is closing down and Kevin's like, oh my God, we got to go now. <laughs> we have to book a flight today, Ten. We're leaving for tomorrow. <laughs> so he did have to check himself and I was like, wow, like, you know, like we even run into this, like even in the outside world, like it's not mm. just mythology, anything like that with death and stuff, but you know. People are trying to pull one over on like Disney adults and everything that, you know, Animal Kingdom is not opening next year. I feel like that happens more often than not, you know, especially with uh, the world of social media. We all know that news spreads like wildfire and it could be so wrong. I see it happen to celebrities all the time where like someone will say something and it's completely false and then the whole internet picks it up. And it's like, I would truly hate to be a celebrity because someone right. can just say, yeah, um, you know, let's see. Miley Cyrus didn't leave a waitress a tip in a restaurant and she's terrible and she like is the worst. And then the whole internet picks it up and she's like, I actually never been to that restaurant in my life. You know what I mean? So it's like, I mean, anyone it, can just say anything and roll with it. 100%. And that is, I mean, I don't know if we've talked about it before, but recently the craziness on the internet was the tomb of Osiris has been oh, uncovered. Yeah. And it was like, first of all, the pictures don't match. They're not from the same site. Um, it was uncovered in 2015 and it's just not accurate. And people are saying mm -hmm. like, the God is buried there. It's not, it's based on, you know, a mythological mm -hmm. um, architectural building that did occur in Egyptian mythology. So that is what that tomb is. But, you know, that spread like wildfire. Like, yeah, it usually does. A few accounts just have to pick it up. But I'm so sad for Animal Kingdom. They don't deserve that kind of slander, even though it is not my favorite Disney park. I, I need them to rebuild. They need to build more into it. Like, if I'm not buying the Hopper Pass, I don't go to Animal Kingdom. You know what I mean? It's not the ticket that I buy. I rather go to Magic Kingdom yeah. and Hollywood Studios um, and obviously Epcot. But I can Absolutely. do without animal kingdom so that's why i wasn't shocked when you said it but i was like that also makes no sense because last time i was there they were like trying to build it up so why yeah would they close it down? yeah it i was just like oh my god wait they just like redid mm -hmm. um expedition everest like it is an animal sanctuary so i'm like but yeah good news it's not closing <laughs> you heard it here first no fake news here um yeah very interesting but also not surprising the way that the internet works but other than that how are you anything new in life what is going on oh you know um trying to finish my dissertation this semester so look out your girl is defending this spring look out for so april um i'll likely be maybe putting up a link to my defense it'll be up via zoom but I'm super excited to be done. <laughs> I can't wait for you to be done. It's going to be awesome. And I feel like you're just going to be free. You could just. I don't know what it's like to not be in school. I have been in school, but you start kindergarten at five. Mm -hmm. I am 29. I've been in school for 24 years. It's too long. 
It's, it's, it's too, too long. long. Like I've only ever gotten my bachelor's degree because I never had to go get my master's or my PhD. And then now I'm a witch full time. So <laughs> I don't think I need to, <laughs> I go to a different kind of school. It's spiritual school. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, learning never stops no matter if you're in school or not, but doing homework and papers and research, I truly do not miss that at all. Oh yeah. I mean, I had like this crazy, like epiphany and eureka moment the other day because when you stare at the same 50 images like something's gonna jump out at you eventually Mm -hmm. or you're gonna lose your mind um but even doing the research aspect just takes so much like the writing part doesn't take long it is getting all of the research and all of the ducks in order and i mean i've been waiting on emails back from museums universities institutions being like hey do you have this piece in stock Mm -hmm. um because sometimes these images that I'm looking at, they only exist as drawings. One of them was in a uh, Berlin museum. And unfortunately the piece, the artifact was bombed in world war II. So it only exists as a drawing now. That sucks. But how are you? (laughs) How am I? I'm doing good. I have been just trying to find new hobbies. I'm just kind of exploring myself and like life this year. I'm trying to figure out what I'm into, what I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, excuse me. <laughs> <clears throat> I also really want to join like a paranormal investigation team. That's like on my bucket list this year. I mean, we can start our own. Okay. So I keep getting that idea and I'm like, who up there is trying to tell me to start my own paranormal team? I just team like don't have book. equipment. Like I don't have any like EMFs or things like that, but I really want to get back into paranormal investigating. I loved it when I did it at Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. So I've been, oh my God, this is so funny. I've been like Googling uh, mediums for hire for paranormal investigations in my area. <laughs> I mean, I found nothing. So I might have to just start my own. <laughs> I did get an EMF reader for Christmas. So is someone trying to tell us something? <laughs> Scratch that off the list. <laughs> I feel like um, we ha- we're we going to have to just start our own paranormal investigation team. I think so. Like we already have Six and Bones University, Six and Bones podcast, Sticks and Bones, paranormal activity. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? But yeah, so I've been really like diving into that. Um and yeah, oh, for the Six and Bones University, I am working on currently a spirit guide course. So that'll be coming out soon. I am working on it as much and fast as I can, but I've also been trying to take some breaks and relax and some self-care. I feel like once January hit, you and I really hit the ground running. Oh yeah. There was no we were like We were like, no breaks. We have so much to do today. <laughs> so... <laughs> We just have a lot of shit going on, but that's really it in my world. Um, Oh, we have a new launch in the metaphysical store Mm -hmm. today. If you're listening now, it is today. It is happening today. (laughs) today. Uh, We are launching our quote unquote Valentine's Day collection. I wish we had another name for it. I don't like Valentine's Day. Yeah. Nah. I've never been been a fan of Valentine's Day. Me either. And let me tell you something. If you're single out there, I remember those days and I used to hate Valentine's day. I used to delete Instagram off my phone. Um, and I used to order Domino's pizza and sit (laughs) in my apartment and eat pizza by myself. Um, but you know what? Valentine's day is for everybody. So it's for, it's for all the girlies, no matter how you identify it's for for everybody, It's for everyone. Although like Kevin and I do not go out on Valentine's day. That is the biggest thing I've ever learned. But no. like, we'll just stay at home and just watch movies and stuff. But, you know, if you guys have any like crazy Valentine's Day stories, send them to us. I want to listen to them because every Valentine's Day that comes around, I reflect back on my exes and I'm just like, wow, you guys were trash. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, well, I want to let's, you know what? While we're here, I'm going to tell a little X story. I'm not going to get too into it, but I'm just going to say one thing someone did to me. I'm not going to tell you the whole story because we'll be here for hours, but one time um, I was dating this guy who we had been on and off for a really long time. And um, anyway, long story short, I go out with some of my friends, right? Him and I are talking. I'm not telling anybody we're talking because all of my friends hated him. So, you know, I'm doing it behind their back. I'm like, hee, 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 like texting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, me. I meet up with some of my friends from college and we're going out to a club. Okay. This was years ago because I'm 30 and I would disintegrate if I walked into a club today. But anyway... <laughs> I'm getting dressed and one of the girls that's with me, she goes, oh my God, can you believe this? 
look at what so-and-so is texting me. I look, it's the guy that I'm dating. (laughs) He's telling her how he wants to take her out, how she's so beautiful. Literally, I wanted to puke because I had just saw him the day before. I wanted to puke. So I'm sitting here and I didn't want to seem like an asshole. I knew, I like knew I should never talk to this guy again. I was about to cry. He ruined my night. I got so drunk. I was like, did I still, did I still see him after? I did. (laughs) Listen, I was young and I didn't know what I was doing. And now I know we all have that that one mistake. Oh my God. So you know what? Fuck him. Honestly, fuck him. I, I. I too will share. Um, yeah, share a story. I think this we got to get motivated for Valentine's Day. If you're um, with a shitty person, dump them. Dump them. You can do better. We're a self help um, podcast. Now. <laughs> um. So mine wasn't actually around Valentine's Day when this occurred. It was right after my birthday. So Rogue One had just come out. This was circa 2016. Okay. And so you were young into. I had just started my first semester, my master's. So I was 22, 23. A baby. Baby. And I had just gotten a very severe concussion. And my ex at the time was like, well, I really want to go see Rogue One. So we went. And what's one thing you're not supposed to do when you have a concussion? Sleep. Look look at screens. Oh. (laughs) And what is a movie theater? A giant screen. But a big old screen. (laughs) So, so he totally disregarded your health. Disregarded my health. Like, couldn't see straight. Afterwards, I'm walking out of here like, I, I, it's a damn fun house. Like, it was horrible. I was in excruciating pain because of that for, like, weeks after. So. Yeah. Shout so him. shout out to you guys. And if you're listening to our podcast, don't. <laughs> Could you imagine? Do you know what he's doing right now? What? No, like, that axe. Do you know, like, Oh, what? no. I have no clue. Listen. Listen to me. When I, when I was like 28, which was two years ago, I literally woke up out of like this weird funk I was in and I deleted all of my social media accounts and restarted because my, all of my old accounts had people from high school that were following me. And I think I've talked about it on the podcast before and I hated it. I was like, these people don't need to know my life. I don't even talk to all a thousand of you anymore. I'm deleting it. So I completely like got rid of everything. And honestly, I live my life in peace. I don't know what anyone is doing. I don't know what any of my ex-friends are doing. I live in complete ignorance and it's great. (laughs) Ignorance is bliss, honestly. It's great. I just focus on myself and like the only Instagram account I have is CL Chthonic Witch. So it's like my business facing Instagram account and also like a little personal, but I don't have any other. That's it. It's done. That's crazy. Do you know what he's doing? No. Yeah, who even cares? See, that's so great when you get to this point. So if you are like heartbroken, you're like, wow, will I ever get over it? Oh, you'll get over it. Trust. You'll get over it and you'll want to step on their throat. So, I mean, looking back, I'm like, why do I want to know? Like, I have no ill feelings towards him. Um, I hope he's happy. I think he's getting married. Um, I'm going on almost three years of marriage. Like, Kevin and I, great together. Like, I am happy the way I am. And I know, like, that was truly just a life lesson of what you're not going to end up with. <laughs> yeah, right. 100%. No, it just was a life lesson. Yeah, I always thought like if he ever said anything to me, I would just be like, listen, buddy, I'm a witch and I would just hiss at him. Your name's going to go in a jar somewhere. So just back Watch up. It. Yeah. Back up. <laughs> <laughs> you triggered my fight or flight and I yeah. am a flightless bird. So exactly. I got nothing <laughs> to lose here, man. I'll put your name in a jar. <laughs> Let's light this candle. <laughs> Oh my God. I wonder if we're like feeling so empowered because we're talking about Hikate today and she really is a goddess of like empowerment. That just like came to my mind. The minute that you and I started talking about our exes and how we've moved on, it's like, listen, man, you come back here, you're catching these hands. That's especially when I said, don't talk to me anymore, you know? Oh yeah. Hands rated E for everyone. (laughs) Yeah. And one more thing before we continue on. Yeah. Do not let people use birthdays and holidays as an excuse to talk to you. I hate that shit. You (laughs) haven't talked to me all year and you're going to text me on my birthday. Happy birthday. Wow. I wish you well. No, that's actually. So in Italian folk culture, when someone gives you a compliment and they don't mean it, it's actually like someone hexing you. So I'll never forget. Someone texted me on my birthday when I turned 30. I haven't talked to them in a whole year. So like, Mm -hmm. I wish you well. No, you don't, bitch. (laughs) 
take that bag. You can take that well and shove it. (laughs) Yeah, shove it right up your pie hole. Yeah, no, that's a great thing. And I feel attacked. Like, (laughs) do you know my life? Yeah, right. It's like, do not, do not use holidays and birthdays as an excuse to talk to me. You haven't asked me how I am all year. That's how I like really now vet people. It's like, if you're only going to text me on Christmas, well, we're not friends. No, I do that. I do that even for family members. Like, do not emotionally gaslight me on certain holidays or certain time periods. Do not, um, you know, use deceased family members to- Oh, people do that shit all the time. To guilt me into it because I'll tell you what, ain't gonna work. (laughs) No, it's not gonna work. So here's a little bit of advice to our listeners on the podcast. Welcome to the self-help section of sticks and bones we are not only paranormal investigators now we also are going to write a book in barnes and nobles in the self-help section so i'll dump him with a guillotine next to it yeah dump him with the guillotine wow ted write that down that might be a book idea somebody trademark it <laughs> oh okay well we gotta move on we gotta, we gotta move on um but you know yeah, maybe email us your Valentine's Day stories. You should do that. Email us evoking.cmc at gmail.com. Your terrible Valentine's Day stories. Did you go on a date? One time I went to a Bumble event on Valentine's Day. I'll talk about it in the next episode. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Okay, I did. Wow. Yeah. Listen, times were tough back then, okay? <laughs> times were freaking tough, but all right. <laughs> I don't know how to segue into Hikate now, but now we are going to Times were tough. About- do you know about a dark... Uh, tough goddess hikate done (laughs) i really feel like in the third episode we tend to find our stride a little bit more so here we go here we are third one's a charm okay well today we wanted to talk about hikate because you know what triggered this chelsea and ten i'm sure you might be asking why do a second episode well you know i just feel like i saw a lot of misinformation on the internet the other day and i just like Instead of like calling people out or being mean, I'm just going to talk about it on my podcast. You know, I'm not going to tell you who was giving the misinformation. I understand people do a Google search and then they take that and they're like, this is who she is. And I never think when people are giving bad information, it's coming from a place of malice. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think people are just genuinely excited to share something 80% of the time, 10% of the time. I think it's for clout. So you know, I never want to be mean to people that are giving misinformation because they're just excited about an ancient goddess. And so am I. Yeah. I will never, even with my students, like you can tell who's into it. You know, I will always tell my students, you know, if if you have a certain major, like gear your final project towards that. And you can see the spark of inspiration and how these people out here are falling in love with, you know, paganism again and the old gods and they're realizing you know that that's who they want to follow and for someone to be overexcited and wanting to kind of just showcase that and then for somebody to come in and stomp on that yeah it's almost kind of like you're stomping on a flower and you're just like no right and I think about the courage that it takes for people to post something on the internet to be like I found this goddess Hikate and she is Persephone and Demeter you know that's what I saw the other day that kind of like sent me over the edge But instead of being mean to people, they're just excited. They want to like get involved back into the Greek gods and goddesses. And there's a ton of misinformation on Google. So it's like, you know, we don't need to be mean to people. We're just, we're just going to talk about on our podcast instead. You know, I'm never going to like call somebody out. Yeah. So Chelsea, who is Hecate? Who isn't Hecate? And I'm not sure if you can hear Pluto behind me. He's crying for dinner time. So So I know we talked about Hecate in the last episode with her mother maiden and crone aspect, but Ten and I feel like we didn't really do it entirely justice because we really want to talk about her from the beginning, um, her ties to ancient Greece and how she's actually changed over time. Because another piece of this episode today, we're going to be talking about how deities evolve over time. And Ted and I were just talking about this. I'll answer your question in a second. Um, Before we even got on the podcast, we were comparing notes about Hikate and she just keeps evolving. Yeah. Whether it's like a hundred years from now or, you know, a few more after that, like she's just always evolving. So 
Mm -hmm. I have some of her epithets here, and I think this is a good place to start. Um, So here are a few names for Hecate. She is the Greek goddess of necromancy, the crossroads, torches. She resides in the underworld, right? Everyone knows her from the hymn to Demeter. Um, Mm -hmm. But here are some of her names. She's the earthly one, the torchbearer, of the ways, the key bearer, the child's nurse, which I actually don't know what epithet this is. Do you know what that is? It's because she um, protects children. And she would, right. I did know that, but is that like in any sort of Greek mythology? Um, not like mythology wise of like a story pertaining to it, but ancient authors are writing like, here's who would be petitioning her. And it names, you know, fishermen, farmers, and children are actually part of that. Yes. I did know she did actually protect children. I'm like, I don't remember reading a story about that, but interesting. <laughs> Um, The light bearer, which is another interesting one before the gate companion savior, which is another Mm -hmm. one, which kind of like hit me with some religious trauma. I was like, I, they always say that about Jesus. You know what I mean? (laughs) Okay. Um, Three bodied and of the three ways. So those are just uh, a handful of her names. She is also known by so many other things. Absolutely. Holy crap. She is just everything in a sense. I know. Um, where do you really want to start this? Because I feel like she's so complex. Um, I think I think the best way to start is kind of at the beginning. Um, so who is she in her earliest form? Because when you start there, it really showcases the point of divinities, gods, and goddesses evolving with the times. Mm-hmm. So I think we kind of have to map out who she was at the beginning in order to move forward to look back and be like, well, that's what it was 2000 plus years ago. Here we are today in 2023. Yeah, that makes total sense. Is this what um, we were talking about before her association with the other goddess? Yes. Interesting. All right. You want to take that one? Yeah. Okay. So I dove into a rabbit hole earlier for this episode. Not mad about it. Not mad about well, it before, at all. Well, before you go on really quickly, um, mm-hmm. I do feel like she was really guiding our research today, Hikate. As you all know, Dad and I are devotees to the underworld. And she had me read this same line in my book that I almost disregarded because I'm like, ah, I don't know. Is that really true? You know, sometimes I'm looking at books with like a magnifying glass, like, oh, no, no, what's the source on this? But 10 and I had been comparing notes before we did the podcast. And she was like, what's the goddess's name that you got? And we both got the same one. We <laughs> both were researching the same thing. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It is. It's like we're such <laughs> It's almost like she's guiding us or something. Um, okay. So um Let's just go ahead and dive in. So the biggest thing to kind of start with is scholars don't know where she comes from. I think we just got to kind of lay that out there and build from that. And I think, hold on, before you go on, I think people mm -hmm. need to be open to that idea because, you know, she is a huge part of ancient Greece and Rome. But Mm -hmm. I think Hecate is just so complex in herself. And the pieces of information that Ted and I found today might shed some light on this. We're not saying this is 100% correct, but it's definitely a theory. And it's definitely worth thinking about because to me, it makes sense. Yeah. And these theories have changed over time. There are Mm -hmm. older theories that no longer hold water. And, you know, that is what it's like as an archaeologist, you know, anybody who reads, you know, ancient literature, like your theories are going to change over time, depending on, you know, what we uncover in the ground. Right. But the idea here is that we don't exactly know if she is local to Greece Mm -hmm. because now we have a few different things. So She is given different lineages depending on what source author you are looking at. So authors right now, not even a lot of the times getting the same lineage correct. Um, That could just be, you know, mistranslations, authors not agreeing with one another, but it is something to think think about. Um, She appears in only a few Greek myths. And when she does, it's it's not focused on her. She Mm -hmm. is a supporting character. Yes. But it is theorized that she comes from Asia Minor, specifically that she is coming from Anatolia, modern day Turkey. And it is theorized that she's also coming from the north, 
So these ideas of female goddesses are coming in via trade to Greece. So it's coming from the north and it's coming from Turkey. There's also some theories stating that ideas for Hecate may have come from Crete and going up to Athens. They all could be true because we are seeing some similarities Mm -hmm. in goddess representations, one of which is heavily mentioned, and that is the goddess Kibli. And she is an Anatolian goddess. Um, We believe that we might have some evidence for her going back to 5000 BCE um, with iconography, but she is a great goddess figure. She is a great mother goddess. And that doesn't fit with Hecate as we know her today. So then the next question is, okay, well, why are there similarities here? And it's because Hecate in her earliest form was not associated with the underworld, the moon, necromancy, or magic. She was associated with, you know, um, she takes on the role of being a gatekeeper for houses. Mm -hmm. And at the time of these myths being written in Greece, it doesn't seem like the authors really know about her, which would suggest that she she has a newer cult kind of coming into Greece. It makes sense because when you do read Greek mythos, you're right. Hecate is always a supporting character. And that is something I always kind of struggled with when I was reading mythology because she's so heavily known and she was heavily worshipped in the Mediterranean area. But Mm -hmm. it's like, how is she becoming this huge divinity when it's like in mythology, Greek mythology, she only had these small roles. And it's like, so I think, you know, that in itself proves that deities do evolve over time. And yeah, this is all circumstantial, right? This is what we're thinking. And these are theories. This is not a hundred percent, but remember that I do feel like, you know, where they're coming in from different places and like you're taking on different things and creating a different goddess. It doesn't mean she's not valid or not relevant or doesn't exist. It's just, where are these ideas coming from, especially coming into Greece? How are they coming up with these ideas? So, mm-hmm. and even if we're going from there, okay, she shows up and even the same ancient authors have mixed, I guess, reviews on her. Mm-hmm. We're getting mix ups with who she is even with the same author. And the first one I want to talk about is Hesiod. Mm -hmm. Um, In his catalog of women, he actually states that Iphigenia is transformed by Artemis into Hecate. And Artemis and Hecate, when you look at Greek family trees, they are cousins Mm -hmm. because their mothers are sisters. But in the hymn to Hecate, which is in Hesiod's Theogony, that is the earliest passage that we have about her specifically. So it is really interesting that even during the 8th century BCE, there's no ties to magic. There is nothing. She is new. Well, I think we had this on a podcast. I wish I could find the clip. Didn't I ask you point blank, is Hakata even a goddess of witchcraft? Because... I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it either. And I'm not saying that she isn't. This is me not saying that she isn't because once again, deities evolve over time and they do take Mm -hmm. on modern interpretations, but I could not find it in any Greek text, any mythos, anything anyone was saying. And we talked about this. It's only really found in the Greek magical papyri where you see people petitioning her or doing rituals with her or evoking her. Um, I know she was part of like curse tablets and things like that, but Mm -hmm. I was like, how... You know, my mind is, how is she a goddess of witchcraft? I don't know. Like, it doesn't explicitly state that. Yeah, there's no evidence of, like, any inscriptions or anything that's even, like, Hecate is goddess of witchcraft, necromancy. And I think that's really interesting because over time, curse tablets, and I think that's because she is residing in the underworld. Right. But even in the early days of her in literature, there's no chthonic ties right so she's evolving constantly she's just always kind of morphing into different epithets and different figures and taking on different roles and that's why i love her because she's so complex she's so really is and it might stem from the fact of who her parents are they're two Mm -hmm. titans and because of what they rule over 
she in a sense kind of has domain over everything i mean she has it sky water land under like she has everything mm-hmm. so already she in herself is changing to fit that right yeah and i want to go back to the <clears throat> magic perspective because i know we talked about this too when i was mm-hmm. reading um by the way one of a really great book to read about hecate is um hecate liminal rights i absolutely love this book and it actually was backing up some of the research Ted had been doing. She was like looking into her dissertations, um, especially about that mother goddess. How do you say her name? Sir? Kibli. Kibli. I almost said Serbili. <laughs> Kibli. <laughs> they mentioned that in here about how they think she, they, Hakate originates from Turkey. Um, just one line though. They just briefly mentioned it and I touched <clears> upon <throat> it today, but um, they too, um, were talking about her as a goddess of witchcraft. And it's like, there's no specific source. And The only thing that I can think of, or I'm theorizing, is how she's closely associated with Cersei and Medea, and those are two, like, great witches. So I don't know if that's where she starts to take on the role, um, and because she's in the magical papyri, but it's interesting. It is, um, because, what do you call it, the theogony doesn't have that. Right. Has nothing. She basically really, unfortunately, she doesn't have really any defining characteristics that we would see today. But you look at the hymn to Demeter, which, you know, roughly same time period, but separated roughly by a century. That is where we find a little bit more dimensionality with her. Right. Even though she only shows up three times in the hymn to Demeter, by the end of that myth, in a sense, she has a more defined character which goes into crossroads, touches on magic a little bit, but more in the sense of liminal spaces. Um, That is where she becomes more tied to hounds. And that is where she becomes more tied to ghostly followers. Right. So we're seeing her become a little bit more prominent in the hymn to Demeter. And that is where her ties to the Sonic really occur. Mm -hmm. Right. And And serving like Persephone and everything and being associated with the underworld. So She's so interesting and fascinating. And that's why I I couldn't wait to do a second episode today because I know we kind of were just debunking some rumors about her with uh, the mother maiden and crone, mm-hmm. which could be a, like we said, an evolved version of her today that she's taking on because people are seeing her that way. Um, this is why I say like deities do evolve over time. I mean, there's so many instances of that, even just with her herself. And we have like other deities that we can even talk about too, but Mm-hmm. Just fascinating. Just talking about this, like, where did the witchcraft aspect from come from? Where did necromancy come from? You know, and that is really what I couldn't find. And like, maybe I'll make a timeline for Hikate really to track her <laughs> transformation because, you know, even her earliest form of art, where we think she's depicted. There's no attributes of Hecate. No, there isn't. And she's not pictured three ways, like the Hecateon. It's just her. It doesn't even look like her. And I was reading about that artwork in this book. And then you showed it to me. And I was like, this does not even remotely resemble anything Hecate. No, it it just looks like a woman. Like, that's that's it. We'll have to post it on Instagram. Yeah, it comes from a book that is published at the end of the uh, 19th century. Um, The piece is currently housed in the Berlin Museum, but... I couldn't find a better quality photo and it's from the sixth century BCE. um, But it is just a woman. Like there's no torches. There's no keys. Like there's nothing that screams Hecate except for the inscription, like sans inscription, a woman. That's it. Yeah. I mean, when I saw the picture, I was like, well, this is who, (laughs) who is this? (laughs) Who is is this? Exactly. (laughs) The sixth century, like where we think we have artwork of her. And then the fifth century BCE is when her lunar connections start. That also confused me with her associations with the moon. And obviously today, most of us work with and worship Hecate with lunar cycles. Like for Christ's sake, I work with her on the lunar cycles. And it's like always in my mind. I'm like, where is this coming from though? Because it's not in Greek mythology. Like there is no Hecate shot out of the moon, you know, <laughs> like there's none of that. There's none of that. There's not. And I couldn't find like a line of Greek mythology or ancient writings that was like Hecate equals moon. But scholars are still arguing today that even in Hesiod's Theogony, it is alluded to 
right. that she does have lunar aspects, but the connection to it is seen by the fifth century. And then by the third century C- BCE, that's when we have her as the holder of the keys where she can open gates between realms, mm-hmm. even to the gates of death. Right. And I think that's how we better know her today as a goddess of liminal spaces and boundaries where she mm-hmm. can open between realms. And I feel like, you know, especially with necromancy, um, especially when they were doing necromancy in ancient Greece, they always met in like a liminal space. It wasn't the living, it wasn't the dead. It was like this kind of in-between area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that's where she really starts to come in. So I feel like a lot of us work with her in that aspect today, but it wasn't as prominent. Oh, no, no. Then. So it's just very interesting. I don't know. I That's why I love researching this because we're working with a very evolved version of Hikate. We're not working with like, just one aspect of her. I feel like we're working with her in many different epithets and aspects. Yeah. Because once we get to Rome, everything changes. Right. I mean, of course. I mean, you said, and this makes so much sense, the necromancy aspect of her gets lost because yeah, can't perform necromancy. So in Rome, she becomes less associated with crossroad cults Mm -hmm. um she is not associated with janice who is also known as the two-faced god who would watch over liminal spaces um she is not associated with any funeral holidays that have to do with um the what do you call it um the haunting of ghosts returning to you know town and all of that she is not associated as like the mother of lost souls anymore it's so weird It's so weird. And, you know, Virgil's writing about her. Ovid's writing about her. um, Lucan's writing about her. And then you have the Greek magical papyri. And it's just like, there's so much constant change happening with her. Well, you know, what's another interesting thing that I was reading, because I had to double take this and Mm -hmm. I just briefly looked at it today. People were doing magical workings with her for love in some of the magical papyri interesting isn't that crazy is it because of the change aspect it might be let me see if i can find it in my liminal rights book i i was like Mm -hmm. reading about it briefly today because there's so much about hikate listen like (laughs) we could have a whole whole hour four hour class on this oh yeah i mean even dreams and nightmares she's associated with and some of the magical papyri so it's like oh yeah who are who are you in the Greek magical papyri, um, which is abbreviated PGM um, because of its Latin name, um, it never mentions her myth, any mythology about Hecate, but it does mention in many of the spells that are preserved that she rules over the quiet dead and she is the change producing moon. So in a sense, when you look at the change producing moon aspect, scholars do argue that she becomes a personification of change itself. That makes sense. So like, I would say if it's for love, I could see it being like the change and like a transformation act. So I'm looking at it now. A lot of it was binding. There, well, there you go. That- Finding. Um, and then a lot of them were uh, attraction using help from some of the restless dead to attract someone towards you, which I think is interesting because I would never think to combine death magic and love magic together where you're like having ghosts go out and do your bidding and um, lesser daemons, right? You're basically making an agreement with Hecate. So, and then it also mentions Hermes. Mm-hmm. So- which I, that makes a little bit more sense because he's just a, a god of a lot of things and communication specifically. So that makes a lot of sense. But um, yeah, I mean, people are using her to bind for love in, in the Greek magical papyri. So, so with binding and love magic, those are technically considered curses in the ancient sense. That makes sense. Because, well, they all fall under the category of magic, which was um, very suspicious and uh, people didn't want to be caught doing it. But with curse curses, if it is going against, you know, if you are trying to uh, put your will into what's going on, you are already doing magic. You are trying to change something in your favor. So that it would sense. make sense that 
she would be invoked for love magic, especially if you are asking for the help of a restless spirit. Right. I know. It's just crazy because when I was reading about that, I don't associate her with that at all, but I guess it's no. not out of the question. I'm like, <laughs> wow. And and that just goes to show you the depth of who she is as a divinity. So it's like when people water her down to just one aspect, I'm like, no, but look at all these other things, you know, she's transforming over time. So yeah, you might be working with her in one aspect one day or worshiping her in one aspect. And then the next day it could be completely different. Yeah. And I wonder if, because she is invoked in curse tablets, if that is her tie to necromancy. That's what I was thinking. Um, cause it does talk about, uh, curse tablets in this book, which, which I knew. Um, so that is where I was kind of making the connection of like, okay. Um, especially her ruling over the restless dead. That's who you would call upon in necromancy most likely. So oh, yeah. like we talked about last episode. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Really interesting. Um, Another thing I want to mention too, because I do study the poison path. Um, she is now considered like the patroness of poison plants and like that type of magic. Mm -hmm. But in ancient Greece, there is no reference to that whatsoever. I know she does have a poisonous garden that's mentioned in some writings, but mm -hmm. her being a patroness of the poison path and using poisonous herbs and being associated with like Belladonna or Mandrake, it's like, where did that come from? <laughs> That is really interesting, too, because if you look at gods for, like, you know, using herbs or healing, like, you wouldn't go to Hecate. No, and I think maybe it's because the death magic aspect of it all. Obviously, the poison path is heavily associated with death, witchcraft, and death magic um, because it can cause death. But And it's used a lot in baneful workings. And I'm wondering if that's where it starts to come in in, like, modern day. So if you read books like um, Pharmacopoeia can't remember for the life of me the other book i'm reading they heavily mention hikate would make sense um it does but, but that's like another evolution of her but you know even going back to the witchcraft and just being like the mother of witches in general like i know chelsea and i we were talking about this prior to the podcast but we both could not for the life of us find any ancient reference to her having that kind of tie no. And like I said, I wonder if it's the curse tablet aspect. Could be that. She is technically related to Cersei. Right. Um. So could that be part? Of I don't know. And because she's found in the Greek magical papyri. So maybe someone just took that and ran with it and like witchcraft, you know? Because the, the Greek magical papyri is a lot of spells. So spells, witches, witchcraft, Hecate. I could right. see it. No, 100% I could see it. And like I said, that is who she is in modern day. So it's mm -hmm. like we don't not recognize that. It's just we're always in the business of like, okay, but where is this coming from? You know, because in Greece, they were not working with her like this. Mm -hmm. But today, in modern day, I feel like everybody's worshiping Hikate, especially if you perform magic or witchcraft. I feel like people really find solace that there is a goddess that rules over witchcraft. That plus, I think um hollywood and oh yeah all of you know television and movies has really kind of also pushed that title of hikate being the mother of witches onto modern society today yeah i mean sabrina um i think she's on sabrina and then also too i was watching white lotus recently which the first season wasn't that great but the second season was excellent i just finished it they were doing something like smoking pot in their room and their mom comes in and, and the mom's like, what are you guys doing? And the girl randomly says, oh, we're performing witchcraft with Hikate. And I almost fell off of my chair. And then in the second White Lotus, they're in Sicily. And the guy like mentions, he's like, oh, this is the place where Hades kidnapped Persephone. And he was just talking about Hades for like five minutes out of nowhere. And I'm like, sir, where is this coming from? No, that's so fascinating. And, you know, the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, like, they were, it was a whole ass coven of witches invoking Hecate. So, it's just so interesting. Like, I mean, my ass evokes her for witchcraft. So, it's well, like, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, yeah, she is a very interesting figure. I know we keep saying that, but that's why, you know, when we say really do your due diligence on looking into deities that you are worshiping, especially Hecate, because 
most people are worshiping Hecate. I feel like she has such a huge name today. And I'm, I love that. I mean, I love the revitalization of worshiping Greek gods and goddesses again, as long as it's done with respect and research Mm -hmm. and understanding, but yeah, you really see her evolving over time. And I love that. I mean, I think it's amazing, but to say that deities don't evolve. I mean, we just kind of really disproved that theory of they can't like, they are gods. They will evolve with us and alongside of us. Yeah. And I mean, I, would like to enter into evidence your honor um a second case study of medusa i was just gonna go there (laughs) i mean if you haven't listened to already we did we're not going to go into it today but we did a whole episode on medusa um people really get so amped up about medusa and like her different retellings and like people are getting angry at one another because they don't know the greek version but everyone knows the roman version better and that's that's on ovid (laughs) that's on ovid um (laughs) But it's, but it's not like it's wrong for people to resonate with one over the other. Like, why does Hikate get a pass, but not Medusa, you know? Fair is fair, because I was just going to ask, why are, you know, modern day practitioners okay with saying, oh, Hikate is the mother of witchcraft, but the same kind of bar is not held for Medusa? Um, I would like to enter another deity into evidence. Hades. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. Here we go. Ready? (laughs) Hades is a god of financial wealth, but wealth back then wasn't wealth to what it is now. And it just meant he ruled over like the earthly minerals and crystals and rocks in the underworld. It didn't actually mean physical money. But today in modern day, we are petitioning Hades, if you work with him, for material wealth and wealth and different things. So people in ancient Greece barely wanted to talk to the guy. (laughs) They were like, unless you're performing necromancy. So I don't know how people can say that deities don't evolve because that's another one I enter into evidence. Yeah. I mean, I think you said it perfectly. That is why he was first and foremost considered the God of wealth because that is to the ancients where all wealth was, it was in the earth, it was underground. Mm -hmm. And he also rules over as Lord of the underworld. So we already have that. And he was already God of wealth prior to receiving his kind of domain mm-hmm. after the um, battle against the Titans. So we already have that kind of shifting him in a sense. And nobody was really petitioning him for wealth back then. I nobody mean, was. I don't, I don't, I did not personally, I've never seen any evidence of that happening, but today it is a practice. Absolutely. And, you know, using him, People would be going to necromancy sites, as we, you know, discussed last week, but they would be going to ask permission for King Hades to allow some, one of the shades from the underworld to come up to do the bidding of whoever. And it really seems like it was super hush hush. It was almost feared because so many people feared him. He's the unseen one. He rules over the land of the dead like Mm -hmm. people weren't out and about being like time to give my offering to hades like i mean no and and honestly when you study hades the realm itself it's actually pretty terrifying like it is it is not a place that you just want to hang out in um it is a very terrifying terrifying place to be and i feel like that's how the ancients viewed death and the underworld so but also too i digress look how people are worshiping him today Plenty of people are worshiping Hades and Persephone together. And it's like, that wasn't happening. People didn't even have altars for him in their home. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying like, this is another case where deities are evolving over time. Like there is a resurgence in worshiping the Greek gods. And for some reason, Hades is now lumped into this where it's like myself included. I'm not even like (laughs) excluding myself, right? I'm a devotee to him, but it's like, how many people were actually doing that in ancient Greece? There's probably a handful of devotees, but, or high priestesses or things like that. And even kind of, you know, as deities evolved, traditions evolved. Mm So um, many of the listeners might know this and I believe Chelsea, you know this as well, but to contact Hades, a lot of people today will say you pat the ground twice. Oh, I thought it was three times. You knock on the floor three times. I was twice. (laughs) Or three. I I thought it was three. You're supposed to... Whatever. It doesn't matter. Anywho, I digress. But but the ancients did the same thing. Not because they were going to petition him, give him an offering, anything like that. 
But when performing necromancy, if ghosts of the undead were not coming up, you might have to pat the ground twice. I've done it. To to kind of wake them up in a sense because they are so far beneath the ground in the underworld that they might not hear you, hear your petition. So that is where that comes from. Yeah, be careful doing that, by the way. I I have done that before um, (laughs) for something that I was doing that I cannot disclose, but I did have to do that. Um, Just be careful. Don't go knocking on the ground and being like, hello, Hades. No, no, no. Don't do that. You know, (laughs) gods of all, look, (laughs) I know we're on, you know, Hades, but I mean, he did kind of evolve quite a bit in Disney's Hercules. That is not Hades. Yeah, you're right. A hundred percent. But I I just mean like, I think him in general, like the Hades we know today is very different than the Hades that was being worshipped in ancient Greece. But deities have to evolve over time with us because obviously we are not in a civilization of ancient Greece anymore. We are different. So they also have to, are constantly evolving with us to fit the time period, to fit what humans need now, right? Obviously our beliefs change. Well, society changes. Not even from ancient to today, but even within the realm of the ancient period, you have from like the geometric and archaic period to classical Greece, there's already change occurring. Mm -hmm. And if we want to bring in archaeological evidence, Your Honor, I would like to enter into evidence, um, a archaic temple to Poseidon. And this came out last year and it's on the same site as a later temple to Poseidon. So already we see changes occurring. Why are they expanding this temple? Why was there an earlier one? Why did they choose the same site to build this new one on? It's still showing that while people, society, culture is evolving as it should, their religion and their religious beliefs and ideologies are also changing with them because that's culture. Yeah. Last thing I enter into evidence, Christianity. You don't think Christianity has changed over time? I mean, come on. Oh, yeah. I mean. So it's it's most belief systems and it's right in front of your face. You just kind of have to look for it, you know? So I think it's healthy. I think it's so healthy. Imagine being uh, sometimes having the same beliefs and it's not really fitting the structure of society today. Like whereas humans are evolving constantly, you know, we're learning new things, taking on different beliefs. The world around us is changing, you know? So um, very, very interesting. Obviously we're not petitioning the ancient gods. Like they would petition them what they would petition them for back in the day. Sometimes we do have, cross similarities but you know we're not petitioning them for the exact same things because we've changed i'm not petitioning them for a good harvest i'm not a farmer no i always think about that with uh like they would petition zeus for storms or demeter right for a good harvest and i'm like you know you can think about harvest in a different way though in abundance in a different way that's why you could still petition them for those things but it's different now like a harvest to me would be like reaping the rewards of all the hard work i put in in a project or a book or my business right Yeah. Or if the springtime or summertime you're planting a flower garden, you're not, you don't need sustenance to support your family, but you'd still like some pretty flowers. And, you know, if you have a nice herb garden. Exactly. Is that not abundance? (laughs) No, it is. So yeah, I think, I think this has been a very interesting journey of talking about Hikate. And I know, you know, we're not going to dive into the basics of who she is. I feel like that's everywhere you can find. She's associated with skeleton keys and torches and hounds and things like that. But it is definitely something to think about if you are a worshiper or work with Hakate or interested in her, you know, mm-hmm. think about how she's evolved and still is. I think it's I think it's important to anybody who, even if you don't work with um, divinities or anything like that, if that's not your path, but just knowing where they come from and understanding how much they've, you know, moved with society, with us, Mm -hmm. you know, if they're not moving and they're not evolving, ask why that is, you know, could it be because nobody worships them anymore? Are they lesser known now? And Mm -hmm. the reason I say lesser known or not really practiced to today, I'm thinking of the Roman God Moors. Like he is such like a forgotten divinity of death. I don't forget (laughs) Moors. 
<laughs> As two death girls, we do not forget Moors. No, because I worship Thanatos, so it's like I always remember Moors. I actually love Memento Mori, like that saying. I have there's a picture on my wall, this little square here. It's called the <laughs> Memento Mori. Um, so I don't forget Moors for the record. I don't. There you go. Oh my god, I love Memento Mori art. That's my favorite. Same. It's so good. I mean, quite literally, my tattoo is very representative of like death and Memento Mori. That was like really the theme behind it. Mm-hmm. So oh. your girl won't forget about Morris. Don't worry. And I'll make sure no one forgets about it. You Square can't. up. <laughs> you can't. But, um, go ahead. Sorry, uh, finish. It's just such an interesting case study, you know, to to look at the evolution of religion. Um, but you know, I do find it interesting, you know, to see debates going on on the internet about do divinities evolve? And, you know, I, and this is why we want to have, you know, these conversations about topics like this. Like, I would love to hear, you know, kind of what everybody else thinks. Like, do you see the evidence that we've provided that, you know, yeah, Picante has evolved or are you still unconvinced? Right. Right. A hundred percent. And like, even their practices evolve over mm-hmm. time. You know, I'm not outside with a shovel digging a goddamn pit to like <laughs> send something to the underworld anymore. You know, not all of us have that luxury. So, and yeah. there's not, no, the necromancias don't exist. So it's like, where are we supposed to go to perform necromancy? Right. You got to make it work. You got, yeah. you got to make it work. So um, yeah, even practices evolve over time. So it is very interesting to see the resurgence of some of these ancient practices and belief systems coming to life. I feel like so more so today than I've ever seen before. And as much as I love it, we do need to acknowledge the original roots of mm-hmm. these divinities and paying um, tribute and respect to their people because while, um, you know, this is an open practice working with Hecate, you do want to pay homage to her traditional roots and the ancient people that really relied on her very heavily um, mm-hmm. where she comes from. So very important. Very, very important. And, you know, kind of on an interesting note to end that ties into, you know, your last statement is um, we do have some upcoming you know death sticks and bones merch get out of out. my head 10 i was just going to say this i'm like after 10 says a statement i gotta say this <laughs> gotcha um, <laughs> um so we do have some upcoming sticks and bones merch surrounding death in the underworld as two death girls but there's going to be a percentage of proceeds from every single sale of those that is going to be actually going back to greece because we are very big devotees to the um, Hellenic pantheon, to the Chthonic, all of that. And we want to put our money where our mouth is. We are just two girls trying to make it all work out. So we are doing what we can. Um, And, you know, every time that, you know, something is bought from us from death merch, we are going to be donating it to institutions that we believe in. Um, We are going to donate it to museums to help you know, curations to help, you know, people learn, um, education, all of that. Um, also for preservation and cleaning of objects, all of that great stuff. Also archeological digs sites require maintenance. I would love that. Sites require security. And it's such a big thing. And it, it truly hits home for me as an archeologist that sites should be preserved for the future. Um, and I know one of the big museums that we want to donate to is the Parthenon Museum mm-hmm. in Athens because, you know, the Parthenon Museum, there's a huge room that is empty because the Elgin marbles, known as the Parthenon marbles, are missing from Greece. They are in the British Museum. And since the 1800s, Greece has been trying to get them back because mm-hmm. that's their home. Yeah, they they deserve to go back. And I know we can do a whole episode on that oh, one yeah. day. <clears throat> but I don't think anyone would argue with you on that. Yeah, I also think it's important to note too, like as a devotee, the best thing you can ever do is help preserve their history because of mm-hmm. they're ancient. And, um, you know, just keep teaching about them, keep talking about them. Like people think that worship has to be leaving out these exuberant offerings and buying these things. It doesn't. 
Sometimes it's just donating $5 to a museum where some of their artwork is, right? And preserving their memory and their history of their traditional roots. So we never want to make sure we're profiting off of them. Like, yeah, we do sell a lot of devotee, chthonic stuff in our store because we have their permission to do so. We do it based on love and respect and wanting to teach people. That's why we have this whole podcast. Um, (laughs) But we really want to help preserve them and their memory. It's very important to us. Like, I could cry. It's so important to me. So important. And, you know, this is why we say, like, like, ask people why they're doing certain things. If you look up to certain people on the internet, ask, you know, for their references, what are you doing with X, Y, and Z? Like, what are your ethics? All of that kind of stuff. And, you know, I think we can all, you know, learn something from one another, ancient and modern. And, you know, that's really what we want to do is preserve the past for, you know, a better future. For sure. I could cry. We went from talking about our exes to getting so emotional. Like I really could cry. I love the Catholic so much and like anything Hellenic, you know, I love ancient practices and it's something that I know we're both so very passionate about, as you can see. I know a lot of our listeners Mm -hmm. are very passionate about it. So those are just some things you can do to preserve their memory and their history and pay respect. So we want to thank you for allowing us to have this platform, for being on this platform with us, because without you all, there is no me in 10. Um, We wouldn't have a podcasting platform. So (laughs) we really appreciate those of you that leave reviews that tell us how much you love our podcast. You know, I know we don't always get back to all of you, but genuinely appreciate it. Um, So once again, thank you for another episode here on Sticks and Bones. Next week, I think we're going to have a guest. So (gasps) I'm so excited. We're not telling you who it is, but it's going to be a hard right turn from what we're usually talking about. And I know they're very excited. So fingers crossed, all goes well. We're going to have a guest next week. Um, And we want to thank you for all your support. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of Sticks and Bones with your ghost host, Chelsea and 10. Bye, everybody. Bye.